All right, how's it going? So questions, PA4 or whatever. template on canvas, download that, fill it in. That it's slightly different. Then you hit yeah. It changes a little from quarter to quarter. Okay. Because fall quarter is really sort of the initial proposal and then winter quarter is sort of your results after having worked on that for, you know, presumably two quarters. And it's it's kind of like it's supposed to be a little further along and then spring is supposed to be a prototype. Or, you know, wherever you got to. Yeah, just download that, fill it in. So would we present it on that day where we come in for two hours of and finish it completely? That's fine. So would we present it? Whatever you feel like is uh, presentable, right? So, so we don't expect people to have, you know, finished working projects even by the end of spring, right? If you do, that's great. But, you know, as far as you've got, um, you know, at this point, it's it's largely probably research. It's learning. It's you know, um, I thought I was interested in this, but I'm really interested in that. Or I thought this would be easy, but it was really hard. Or this was really easy, and so I added some more things to it. You know, so there's there's course adjustments being made, but basically, kind of where you are, what's your current state, um, what have you got so far, and where do you plan to go over the next you know quarter up through um, the June presentation. And you know it's a learning exercise, so the the learning that comes out of this is much more important and more valuable than sort of the final product. All right, other questions. All right, well. Let's um, leave trees for a little bit. Um, I want to go back and talk about another data structure that kind of goes along with stacks, but is a little different. This is a queue. And stacks and queues are, are different but similar. They, they have similar behaviors. Um, but different details. So a stack, remember, we said was a last in, first out data structure. You add things to the stack, you push them, and then when you get ready to remove something, to pop something, the first thing you pop is going to be the last thing that you pushed. Right? So pile of plates at the buffet, you put plates on top, put plates, put plates. When you're ready to remove a plate, the plate you take off is the first one that got put on, the last one that got put on the pile. Right? Um, so it's this last in, first out structure. A queue is, is different in that it's a first in, first out structure. The first thing you put in the queue is the first thing you remove. And accordingly, the last thing you put in the queue is the last thing you'll remove. So they're usually called FIFOs instead of LIFOs. And so quintessential of a queue is, you know, checkout counter at your favorite store. So customers enter at the back of the queue, the back of the line, and they wait till they get to the head of the queue, the front of the line, and that's where you pay your money and your groceries get bagged and you can leave. So the tail of the queue is the end that you enter. The head of the queue is the end that you leave from. Yeah. Is the screen supposed to be blue? No. That took a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so enter at the tail, remove from the head. Okay, so here's, here's your checkout line of the store. Here's the end where the cashier is. Here's the end that you come into. So what happens? Customer A comes along and they start getting their groceries rung up and bagged. And while they're sitting there, customers B, C, and D arrive in that order and they queue up behind the person who's at the head of the queue. 
All right, so person B came in and then C and then D, okay? Customer D is not going to get taken care of until customer A is done and B is done and C is done. Okay, everybody who's ahead of them will get taken care of first. On the other hand, if another customer comes in, customer E, D will get taken care of before them. Okay, so you're processing things from the queue in the same order that they were put in. And so when customer A is done, they take their groceries and they leave, everybody moves up. Right, and now our queue looks like this, and customer B is being processed. And if B is processed, and C is processed, and D is processed, E will make it up to the head of the queue eventually. And when E is finished, if there's nobody who's come in behind E, the queue is empty. Okay, on the other hand, you know, E might be getting processed. And a bunch of other customers queued up, and now this person's backing up against the pile of cereal boxes that's at the end of the queue, right? And nobody else can go into the queue. The queue is completely full. Okay, so we have two conditions just like with a stack. The structure can be empty, the structure can be full. And as an abstract data type, we really just think of two operations, insert and remove. All right, insert, and insert is done at the tail, and remove is done from the head. You'll see some flipping around of that in the literature, but mostly this is the convention, insert at the tail, remove from the head. But occasionally you'll be reading a book and it's not making sense, and it turns out the author's using the opposite definitions of tail and head. So, something to be aware of. All right, the other thing is when we insert into a queue, we need to worry about is the queue full? And when we try to remove from the queue, we need to worry about is the queue empty? Because if it's empty, we can't remove, and if it's full, we can't insert. So we might want, you know, an is empty, is full pair of functions, or we might want insert to be able to return a flag saying that it didn't insert because the queue was full, something. But basically, two operations to interact with a queue, insert and remove. And there's lots of different ways we can implement queues. Right, but as an abstract data type, as the writer of a main program that's using a queue, we'd mostly be calling insert and remove, maybe some initialize function to get things going. Um, but there's lots of ways to implement it. We can implement this with an array. We can implement this with a linked list. We could implement it by paying people outside Fred Meyer to go inside and stand in line. When you want to add something to the queue, you hand them a piece of data and say, go stand in that line. Right? And it wouldn't change the main program if it's just saying insert and remove. Okay? But let's look at how we can actually implement these. Okay? And these are the details that would be like on the other side of the firewall, the, um, the implementation details. But keep thinking about the abstract view. So one way to do this is with an array. So let's, let's picture an array. So here's an array of eight elements. So it's a pretty small queue. Um, and you know, in, in the checkout line, when something gets removed, everything moves up in the line, the queue, right? Um, that's not efficient in software because if your queue is very long, you have to move, you know, n things down one spot in memory. That's not efficient, just like with a stack. It wasn't efficient to actually push everything up or push everything down. 
to do our pops and pushes. So we're going to do what we did with the stack, which is leave the things in memory where they are and just change what we consider to be the head or tail of the queue. So we're going to need a pair of pointers. One I'll call tail and one I'll call head. And tail is where we insert and head is where we remove. And my initial queue, which has nothing interesting in it, would probably look like this. Head and tail would both be zero. And we can tell that this queue is empty because head and tail are equal. Okay, so what happens if we insert something? Let's insert an A into our queue. We store it where the tail is pointing. And then we change the tail to point to the next location. So now tail is 1, head is 0. Q is no longer empty. Head and tail are different. If we insert a B, that'll go where the tail's pointing. We'll increment the tail. If we insert a C, that goes where the tail's pointing. We increment the tail to 3. Okay, we've got three things in our Q now. Now what happens if we want to remove one element from our Q? We return the element that's pointed to by the head. That's going to be the A. And we also increase the head to point to the next spot. So the head is telling us what's the next element to remove. The tail is telling us what's the next spot into which we will insert. So here's a cue. The A got removed, but it's still sitting in memory, right? Because we don't actually get rid of it. We just ignore it. So the next thing we're going to remove is B, and then C, and then the queue will be empty again. And there's stuff in here, right? But it's not considered to be part of the queue because the tail shows where we're inserting, the head shows where we're removing. These are the only things that are actually part of the queue. Is this making sense? All right, so let's insert a D and an E and an F. And our tail is pointing here, and let's remove the B and the C. And now our head is pointing here, and now our Q has a D, an E, and an F. These Bs and Cs are still in here. Okay, let's insert a G. Push the tail down here. Let's insert one more thing, which is an H. What do we do with the tail? If we increase it once more, it's going to point to something outside the array. Is our queue full? We've only got a D, E, F, G, and H. We've only got five things in our queue. Our array holds eight things. It would be a shame to say it was full. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we're just going to roll back over. Instead of moving to this next location, we're just going to go back to zero. We're going to say, okay, here's where we're going to insert the next thing. And so, you know, here's the head of the queue. This is the next thing to remove. Next, 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 next. Here's where we're going to insert. So if we insert an I, we increment the tail, and it points to element one again. So our queue can wrap around. Yeah? Uh, it's not so much that it was removed, it's that that spot's not in use. Oh, I mean, like, so, what if everything's in use? So, everything's in use, then the queue's full. Okay. So, right now, we have D, E, F, G, H, I. We got six things in the queue. Okay, if we try to insert something more, it's going to go where the B was. So, let's put in a J. And now the tail is pointing here at index 2. Mm -hmm. So here's one of the funny things about queues. At this point, we're going to say the queue is full. We've only got seven things in there, and our array will hold eight things. Okay, But if I put one more thing into here, and I increment the tail, the tail and head are both going to be pointing at the same place. That's the same state as when the queue is empty. And if we want to know the difference between the queue is full and the queue is empty, we need another flag that we set saying, you know, we just inserted something and now they're equal, so the queue is full. So the easiest way to do this is just, even though we've got eight spots in our array, just decide we can only store seven things in our queue. 
And if we get to a situation where the tail plus one would equal the head, we say the queue's full and we won't let you add anything else. And then of course, if you remove the D and the head changes to this next location, now we could store something where that C was, right? And the tail will come down to point to where the D was and now the queue is full. So this takes some some working with to to be able to understand it well enough to code it. But once you understand this and you you've played with wrapping around and when is it full and so on, coding it is really straightforward. Okay, it's it's only marginally more complex than a stack was. So let's let's look at how we might code this. So let's let's just make a queue of we'll just do eight, but it could be anything, right? Um, so eight characters, and we'll have size, which tells us how big our array is. Um, and we need a pair of integer pointers, head and tail, indexes into the array. So our initialization routine just set the head and tail equal to zero. That basically empties out the queue. And we could set them equal to one, we could set them equal to seven, we could set them equal to anything we wanted, but if the head and tail are equal, the queue is empty. If we set them both equal to three, what it means is we're going to start storing things in the middle of this array. That's perfectly fine, right? Because when we get to the end, we'll just wrap back around to the beginning. But usually, you know, we just initialize by setting them equal to zero. That just makes us feel better. But it really makes no difference. All right, how do we know if the queue is empty? Just see if the head's equal to the tail. So just return the Boolean value of head equals tail. That's our is empty function. Right now with a stack is empty with something like if stack pointer equals zero. And the queue could be empty, but tail could be non-zero. Right? In this case, if, if I pop off a few more things, head and tail will both be equal to two. That's going to be our empty queue. So that's our condition for being empty. All right, how do we insert something into the queue? The tail tells us where we should store something when we insert. So the first part of this is just queue bracket tail equals n. And then after we store it, we want to increment the tail. So I can just do a post increment here if I want. And then the one thing we have to check is if the tail gets to be the size of the queue, if it was a 7 and we increment it to an 8, we have to set it back to 0. So if tail equals size, then set tail equal to 0. So that's the rollover part. We could also just do tail equals tails modulo size. And then if tail is equal to size, it'll be set to zero, otherwise it'll stay unchanged. Either way, that's our whole insert function. And it's it's basically, you know, our push code, post increment but with this extra condition that when we get to the end of our array, we can roll it back over.
All right, how do we remove? We have to return the element that the head is pointing to. So let's do something like, you know, R equals Q bracket head. And we want to increment that. And again, if head equals size, head equals zero, and then return R. Store your element where the head is pointing, and then bump up the head, roll it over if you get to the end. Okay, how do we know if the queue is full? Basically, if tail plus one equals head, then the queue is full. Right? So if inserting one more thing would make the tail and head equal, well, when we insert, we increment the tail. So if the tail plus one equals the head, Right, with the caveat that if the tail plus one is equal to the size, then we need to see if the head's equal to zero. So there's there's different ways to code this, but one easy way would be the following. If the head is equal to tail plus one modulo size. And we can just return that. So if the head's equal to one plus the tail, including the rollover, then the queue is full. Otherwise, it's full. It's not full. So it's not it's not bad to code up with an array. Um, in the past, I've had people do this for um, a programming assignment where you implement stacks and queues, and it's not bad. Um, it's mainly this business of the rollover and, and peculiarity of noticing when it's full. Um, but another option for implementing a queue is to use a linked list. Right? The disadvantage of this is our queue has a fixed size, in this case 8, which means we can hold at most 7 things in our queue. If we want our queue to be able to be arbitrarily large, this doesn't work unless you do something like when the queue is full and you try to insert, let's make a copy of it and grow it and you know have a larger queue. Um, so a linked list will work nicely here just like it did for a stack. So for a stack, remember the way we used a linked list was like this. When you wanted to insert, when you wanted to push something into the stack, you just put it in the very beginning. And when you wanted to pop from the stack, you just returned the first element and removed it from the list. Okay, nice order one operation. Doesn't matter how much stuff is back here, when you want to push, put it in the beginning. Right, have it point where the sentinel is pointing, have the sentinel point to it. When you want to pop, have the sentinel point where this node is pushing and just return this node's data. So that's order one for a stack. Turns out it's the same for a queue. So linked list can look like this. So here's the sentinel, if you have a sentinel. And the best way to do this, or the easiest way to do this, is to put your tail back here on the right and put your head over here on the left. Okay, so if you want to insert well, if you want to remove, just return the first element of the list. All right, take this off, have a sentinel point to where it was pointing. If you want to insert, just make a new node, put it on the end of the list, that becomes the tail. 
and you're going to have to remove all the things that are already on the list before you remove the tail. So it's a first in, first out, last in, last out. So removing is very efficient, right? That's order one, doesn't matter how big the list is. Inserting, if you don't do anything special, it's going to be order n because you're going to have to move all the way down to the list to get to this last node and then tack a new node on the end of it. But it turns out we don't have to do that. We can have a pointer called last node that just points to the last node of the list. And now if I want to insert something new, what do I do? I make a new node. I have last node arrow next point to that new node. And I change last node to point to that new node. And now I've moved my tail. And that's order one. I didn't have to do anything with all the nodes that came before it because I already have something that points to the back of the list. And it's not a doubly linked list, right? But it's, it's just using a pointer to get me to the end without having to traverse all the way through. That only works if you're inserting at the end. If you try to remove from the end, then you have to have a way to go backwards. Because once you remove this, you need to change the last node to be the node before it. And unless you have back pointers, you got to go all the way from the beginning. So that's got to be set up just right, but not that hard. They are. Yeah, aren't they wonderful? The only thing better is trees. All right, so we can implement queues a variety of ways. Um, what do we use them for? So we can use them for job scheduling and operating systems. So when you look at the list of jobs on a CPU, there might be two or 300 jobs that are in various states of running. And there might be you know, six of them that are ready for the CPU. And generally what this operating system does is it takes a job and it loads it into memory and it points the programmer, the program counter at you know, the right place in that chunk of code and that causes the program to start executing. And before it does that, it sets a timer and says, hey, wake me up in a millisecond. So for a millisecond, that program is running, it's all happy, it's got the CPU's attention. After a millisecond, the timer goes off, generates an interrupt, if you've done 270, it's that kind of interrupt. The operating system wakes up and it says, oh, that job's had a millisecond of time, let's give somebody else a chance. So it will take that job and it will take its current state, the contents of its memory, its variables, and so on, and it basically sticks it aside in memory and it moves it to the back of an execution queue. And now the next job in the queue gets taken out of the queue, loaded into memory, it points the program counter at that, sets a timer for a millisecond, and it's off and running. And so, you know, job A is executing, jobs B, C, and D are waiting. After a millisecond, A is removed from the queue, put back in the tail, and now B starts to execute. And after a millisecond, the operating system throws it in the back of the queue, and now C starts to execute. And maybe C finishes, and so it doesn't go back in the queue, and now D executes, goes in the back of the queue. A starts to execute, goes in the back of the queue. B starts to execute, and maybe a new job E comes along, and another job F, and another job G. And these are queued up behind the job that's currently executing, which is D. Right? And each time something gets removed from here, it runs for a little bit and then goes in the back of the queue. So these jobs are processed in order. And that's, you know, there's a part of the operating system that's just doing that all day, just processing jobs. And you might have multiple queues. You might have a low priority queue and a high priority queue. And jobs that are very important, the ones that the system is running itself, might go in this high priority queue. And the scheduling strategy might be, let's process jobs from here until this queue is empty, and then we'll switch to processing low priority jobs. Right? So as the person writing the operating system, you don't want to put things in here that are going to take a long time to run, because nobody is going to get any CPU time when they're low priority jobs.
All right, but something quick like, oh, let's let's um, you know deal with this packet that's coming in from the network connection, or let's do a quick check on the power level and make sure that we've still got you know good voltage coming into the CPU. Right, those might be high priority jobs. The clock just ticked. Let's update the time of day. That might be a high priority thing. Um, and you can have lots of scheduling strategies. You can say, let's do two of these for every one of these that we do. Right? Or you could give this thing a longer chunk of time, maybe one and a half milliseconds instead of one millisecond. There's all kinds of ways to do this. So that's what you do in an operating system course. That's part of the stuff you would study. Um, but queues are, are an essential part of that. And priority queues are, are a big part of that. Um, And if you look on, an, on a Linux machine, here's our server. It's got 203 jobs, most of them sleeping. Um, but these jobs wake up from time to time and take a little slice of time and um, go back to sleep or go back to waiting for the CPU. All right, so back to trees. So we can use cues to traverse a tree in a different way from how we've been traversing trees for PA4. PA4, the traversals, left node, right, node, left, right, left, right, node, um, those are all what we consider to be depth first. They're depth first in the sense that they tend to move down the tree as far as they can till they get to a leaf node. And then they'll pop up a little bit and move down again. And if we had more stuff hanging off here, right, we'd come all the way down here to the 19 before we pop back up to the 20. And we'd do all of that before we ever start doing the right side of the tree, right? Either node left or left node or, or left right node. We're going to do all of this stuff before we do that stuff. So we're moving down primarily and then we're slowly moving from left to right. Okay, that's the notion of depth first. Plumb down as far as you can and then work your way across. A totally different approach would be breadth first. And here the idea is let's move across the tree and cover everything we can at one level of the tree before we move down. So a breadth first traversal would visit the 20. And then it would visit the 10 and the 30, and then the 5, 17, 40, the 18 and the 35, and then the 19. So it's moving across doing each of these levels first, and as it finishes each level, it slowly moves down to deeper nodes. That's particularly useful if you're trying to print the tree and have it look like this, right? Because we usually print from top to bottom and so we'd want to print out the 20 and then the 10 and the 30 and so on. A left node right traversal is really, really hard to turn into a picture like this unless you can move up and down in your output. So breadth first is nice for, for seeing this the way we kind of think of it. And breadth first traversal is a really simple algorithm. Um, so we use a queue. This is queue based. Um, we start off by inserting the root into the queue. So this is a queue of tree nodes. All right, and we, then we do the following. Um, if the queue is empty, then we're done. If the queue is not empty, remove whatever is at the head of the queue. Let's call that R. Print R's data and then insert R's left child and insert R's right child and go back up to the top. 
So this is usually not recursive. This is just a while loop. While the queue is not empty, set R equal to remove the head of the queue. Print R's data, insert R's left child, insert R's right child. And these inserts, right, only do the inserts if they're not null. If the node has no left child, don't insert a null into your queue because it makes no, no point. So let's see what this looks like if we run this algorithm on this tree. So my queue, I'm going to put the head over here. So I'm going to remove from the right side and I'll insert things to the left. So it's like our checkout queue we started with. Okay, so we start the whole process by inserting the root into the queue. That's a 20. Okay, now we're just going to repeat this loop until the queue is empty. Okay, if the queue is empty, we're done. It's not empty. So remove the head of the queue and set that equal to R. So R equals 20. Print R's data, so we'll output a 20. And then insert R's left child and right child if they're not null. Well, the left child is a 10, and that goes into our queue. The right child is a 30. And we're done with our first pass. Go back up, the queue's not empty, so remove the head. That becomes R print its data, and then insert R's left and right child. Well, the left child is 5, the right child is 17. And we go back up to the top. Q's not empty, so set R equal to what's at the head of the queue. That's a 30. Print R's data, and then insert the left and right child of R. Well, there is no left child, but it has a right child, 40, so that gets inserted and go back up to the top. Well, what have we done so far? We've printed the first level, the 20, and the second level, 10 and 30. And we have queued up the elements of the next level. So each time we finish a level, the queue should contain all the elements that are on the next level in that order, 5, 17, 40. So what's going to happen as we go through this a couple of more times, we'll remove the 5, we'll print that out. 5 has no left child, no right child, so we don't do anything there. When we remove the 17, we're going to print that out, and we're going to insert its left child doesn't exist, we're going to insert its right child into the back of the queue. Okay, we're going to insert at the tail. Well, what's that going to do? We're going to put an 18 in here. That's not going to get processed until everything that's already in here is processed. Right? So at each stage, we're inserting things one level deeper in the tree. And we'll finish processing everything at this current depth before we start processing those. And as soon as we start processing things at this depth, we'll be inserting into the back of the queue the things one level deeper. Okay, so this is how we're processing one layer at a time. So we'll remove the 40, print it, push its left child into the back of the queue, take out the 18, print it, no left child, put its right child into the back of the queue, take out the 35, print it, no children to insert, take out the 19, print it, no children to insert. Now when we come back up to the top, if the queue is empty, we're done, there's nothing left in the queue. And what did we print? We printed a 20 first, okay, that was the top level and then 10 and 30, and then 5, 17, 40, and then 18, 35, and then 19. So that's a breadth first traversal. And it's Q based. I have an infinite Q, because I'm special that way. But yeah, we always need to be worried about how big is the queue. If it's list-based, it'll grow until we run out of memory. Um, how big a queue do we need? Well, for this one, yeah, but in general for a tree of n nodes, how big a queue might we need? It's got an exponent in there for sure. 
basically the queue has to be big enough to hold the widest row. Right, so if this is a nice full fluffy tree where every row is filled up, the queue has to be big enough to hold everything that's in that bottom row. Well, this is a good thing to consider. So how many nodes do I have in this tree? See how quickly you can count. Fifteen. How many do I have in the bottom row? Yeah. So in a fully big fluffy tree, half your nodes are at the lowest level. So my tree might only be 30 nodes deep. That's going to have a billion nodes in it which means my bottom level is going to have half a billion nodes as a big queue. So we'd have to do something different there. It's a lot of data, yeah. That's a billion pieces of data. And half of them are at the deepest level, but you know, the deepest level is only 30 hops down, so that's not too bad. And guess what? A half billion of them are not at the deepest level. Yeah. Yeah, basically. All right, well, it turns out we can also use a stack to traverse a tree. And our algorithm looks something like this. Step one, push the root of the tree onto the stack. Step two, um, if the left child exists, push it and go to step two. Step three, if stack is empty, then you're done. Otherwise, pop and print the thing that you just popped. Step four, if right child exists, push it and go to step four. Go to step two, and step five, go to step three. So this is not recursive either. This is a bunch of go-to statements. So there's a tree. Let's see what this algorithm does. So I'll make my stack, and my stack will grow downwards, and I'll keep track of the output down here. So step one, we push the root onto the stack, so there's a 20. If there's a left child of that 20, let's push it. There is, there's a 10, so we push that onto the stack, and we go to step two. There's a left child of 10, that's a 5, so we push it, and we go to step two. If there's a left child of 5, we would push it while there isn't, so we go to step three. Stack's not empty, so we pop the top of the stack and we print it. So we output a 5. And then if there's a right child of that 5, we would push it, but there isn't. So we go back to step 2. Oh, there's not a right child, so we go back to step 3. So step 3 says if the stack's empty, we're done. Otherwise, pop the top of the stack, print it. And then if there's a right child on the 10, push it. So there is a right child on the t of the 10, so we push that. That's a 12, and we go back to step 2. If there's a left child of 12, we push it while there isn't, so pop the top of the stack. That's our 12, print it. And then if there's a right child, push it. Well, 12 does have a right child, 14, so we push that on the stack, and we go back to step 2. 
Okay, 14 does not have a left child. Go to step 3, pop off 14, print it. 14 does not have a right child, so we go back to step 3, which says pop the top of the stack, so there's our 20. We pop it off, we print it. If 20 has a right child, push it. Well, it does. It has a right child 30, so we push 30. Go back to step 2. If it has a left child, push it. It does, so we push a 25. And we go back to step 2. 25 has no left child. Go to step 3. Pop the top of the stack. Print it. 25 does not have a right child, so we go back to step 3. Pop the top of the stack, which is our 30. If it has a right child, push it. It doesn't, so we go back to step 3. If the stack's empty, we're done. Stack's empty, we're done. And we just did a good old left node right traversal. Okay, so that was fast, and I'm not expecting you to memorize this or, or grok it. Um, but I want you to see that, that doing something similar to what we just did with a queue, but using a stack instead, we get a different traversal order. And in this case, we get the traversal order that we call left node right, the in order traversal. Recursion is inherently stack based. Because every time you call a function, you're pushing the current state of the system onto the stack. And when you return that from that function, you pop it off. And this is really just an unwound version of our recursive traversal algorithm. So recursive things tend to be depth first. They tend to be stack based. Things that are breadth first would probably be queue based. And tree traversal is one example, but this pops up in other situations as well. So for example, when you're navigating web pages. Okay, so, um, so you're reading up on, you know, link lists or something, and you see something that catches your eye and you click on it. Okay, you've just made a recursive call. You were in your web browser, and now you're going back into your web browser, but you're navigating a different page. And you're remembering where you were, so that when you hit the back button, you go back to the page on linked lists, right? But now you're reading about, um, you know, some celebrity event. And you start reading that, and you get to something else that catches your eye, and you click on that. And now you're three pages down. And when you finish that, you're going to hit the back button, come back to the celebrity page, read a little more, see something else that catches your eye, go off and follow that. You can do this a bunch of times. Eventually, you come back to the celebrity page, you're done with that page, you hit the back button, now you're back on your first page. Okay, That's a depth first traversal of, of your surfing. A breadth first would be kind of odd. You start reading about linked lists and you see something on celebrities, you're like, huh, that looks interesting. So you write down the address on a piece of paper, but you keep reading about linked lists. And then you see a sports story and you write that down, but you keep reading about linked lists until you get to the end of your linked list page. And now you go to your list and say, okay, I wanted to read about celebrities and about sports. So you click on the celebrity page. And you find five things on there that catch your eye while you write those down somewhere. But you finish the celebrity page and then you go back to the second thing that you had marked, the sports story, and you follow that through and you write down things that are interesting. And then when you're done with that, you say, okay, so what was that other set of things that I found interesting? Okay, that's a breadth first equivalent. And we don't usually work with cues as people. We seem to be stack based. And I don't know if that's human or if it's just our culture. Um, but that's, that's the way we surf. Um, so I'd like you to think about um, running mazes. Think about what you do if you're coming in at the upper left and you're trying to find your way to the exit. Um, play around with that a few minutes between now and tomorrow and think about whether you think you're using a stack or a queue when you do this. And you are using one or the other. Um, but kick that around and talk about it and we'll start from there tomorrow. Alright, I will see you next time.